you know that Keeley Companies is all about fostering the world-class culture through their incredible cultural pillars. Well, it was time to add a seventh cultural pillar, Keeley Green. Guided by the mission to raise the sustainability standards by which they design, build, operate, and live, Keeley Green is dedicated to using a holistic approach to leave a positive impact on our environment, create a future that is sustainable for generations to come. In the words of Rusty Keeley, we are just getting started. You can learn more about that just getting started mentality and all the work they do by visiting my friends at Keeley Companies online at KeeleyCompanies.com. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. I do have a couple of questions for you on the front side of this conversation with a guest that you are going to be extraordinarily grateful you tuned into. Here's the first question. What do you do when life takes a radically unexpected turn for the worse? What do you do when life takes a radically unexpected turn for the worse or for the rest of us? How do you walk alongside others who are going through their own difficult seasons of adversity? Well, we've got an expert on today to help us answer both of those questions. At just 25 years old, Amy Florian tragically lost her husband, leaving her widowed with a seven-month-old baby at home. While surrounded by a multitude of loving and well-intentioned friends and family, she felt completely isolated, totally alone, and filled, this shouldn't surprise you, with despair. Determined to heal, though, Amy began her lifelong mission to help others recover from life's crushing losses. As a certified thanatologist, I challenge you to say that word five times quickly, thanatologist, I barely got it out twice, and a leading expert on death, and loss, and grief, and age, and transition, Amy's practical and insightful work has been crucial in helping innumerable others navigate life's toughest times. My friends, if you have been left to cope with death, or the end of a relationship, or an unexpected loss, or face disappointment, in other words, if you've lived at all, today's conversation is for you. Amy's groundbreaking work on grief, including grief that others may not even deem worthy of grieving, will liberate you to heal, dare you to fully live, and love fiercely the life that is yours. You're going to love this conversation. So without further ado, I encourage you right now to sit up straight, pull those shoulders back, grab your favorite Live Inspired journal and pen, and get ready to voraciously take notes as I introduce to you my friend, and she's about to become yours. Her name is Amy Florian. Amy, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. I am delighted to be here, John. We've been recording, whether I knew it or not, for the last 10 minutes. I'm so glad, though, because we've already laughed. We've already just about cried. We've talked about life and death and grieving and healing and figuring out how to put the pieces together and move forward together. Yeah, I can't wait to have this conversation with you and then share it with our community. For those who don't know you, though, if you were to introduce yourself, how do you respond to that? I would say I am a mother, I am a teacher and a healer, I am a survivor, and I try to make a difference in the world, to make a positive difference for everyone that I encounter every day. Mm. I am not perfect, <laughs> but I try. I really try to make a positive difference for everyone I encounter. There's a lot in that short little bio you just you just gave yourself, including humility is one of the words I, I would have described it with, because as people understand your story and what you've done in your life with that story, it is remarkable. And it's worthy of celebrating and lifting up, which is what we're going to do together. You used a word, though, that I think a lot of times gets thrown around, but maybe not fully understood, the word healer. Tell me, tell me what that word means to you. I'm a healer. Every single one of us has losses, breaks in attachment, 
it's grief is really triggered by a break in an attachment. And we've all got them through our entire life. It doesn't mean life isn't worth living because there is loss in life, because there are difficulties in life, because there is grief in life, because there is illness and disability and death and, and awful things can happen. That doesn't mean life isn't worth living. When we face the difficulties, when we look them straight in the eye, when we're afraid, when we are not reluctant, when we do it anyway, to face those tough emotions, to face those difficult experiences, to work through them, to resolve them, we come to a sense of peace. We come to a sense of recovery of joy in life. When I say I am a healer, what I mean is I try to facilitate that process to help people believe in themselves and believe that their life is worth living and that joy is possible, even if they cannot see it right now. I know sometimes you just cannot even see it right now. You can't imagine how anything good could come out of this, but you hang in there, you get the support you need, you get the wisdom and advice that you need and you get lifted back up again. Mm -hmm. If I can be an instrument of that lifting up, it's one of the things I love about what I do is that I get to see the twinkle come back in the eye. I get to see the shoulders lift again. I get to see the, the cloud disperse and people find joy and peace in their life again. You said, I know, because, because you've been there. And normally I begin interviews first by letting people know what you do today and what matters to you today. And then we normally go all the way back to childhood. And we talk about some of the formative stories for you. It would involve a big, huge dining room table with nine other kids around it and all the chaos <laughs> of that. But I'm going to speed through that a little bit. We'll, we'll come back to having the siblings and the family, because that's certainly part of the journey, but we're going to scoot all the way forward to your early twenties. Okay. So you meet, I just think most men named John just are very handsome. You oh, know, there's, yes. there's just something about those guys. And that you name. bet. So you were lucky enough to meet, fall in love, and he fell in love with you, a fellow named John. T talk about what you fell in love with when you met this man named John. Well, we were high school sweethearts. We had our first date was junior prom in high school. He was genuine and authentic. He was funny. He was goofy. He was caring. And he absolutely adored me. I mean, how can you resist somebody who absolutely adores you? I didn't have to change. I didn't have to perform. I didn't have to anything. John just loved me. So we got married right after freshman year in college. You get married early. You start your yes. life. You have all the big dreams, the grandiose ideas that most young couples might have, mm -hmm. including kids. Yeah. And, and you know, it wasn't at that time, it wasn't unusual. I was born and raised in rural Iowa. Everybody had big families. The family I was in of 10 kids was not unusual. Outside of, of rural Iowa, I get, oh my gosh, you're kidding me. But it was not unusual to have a lot of kids. It was not unusual to get married right out of high school without even waiting until you'd been in college a little bit. It was just kind of the normal thing that people did. That was the, that was the expectation. So at the time... It did not seem unusual to get married at 19. There were people all around me who were getting married at 19. To put a, a timestamp on it and a little geography on it, what, what town were you living in and what year were you graduating high school? Well, I was born and raised in a little town of less than 4,000 people that nobody had ever heard of. It's 25 miles west of Dubuque, Iowa, and it's called Dyersville. Now, Dyersville is famous because it's where they filmed the field of dreams. Oh. When they filled, when they filmed the field of dreams, those are my high school classmates sitting on the bench next to Kevin Costner as extras in that movie. Those are the people I know in the town driving their cars down that windy road to get to the field of dreams with their headlights on. That's awesome. That, those are the cornfields I grew up around. So now Dyersville is famous. In fact, now they're going to play a professional baseball game every year at the Field of Dreams, it has changed the town. But when I was growing up, it was just a little town 
Dyersville in rural Iowa, surrounded by surrounded by farms. Yep. And everybody either was a farmer or they lived in town and served the farmers. So I graduated high school in 1974. John and I got married in 1975. And then life begins and struggles begin. Yeah. Part of that struggle was the struggle of ultimately getting pregnant and then having several miscarriages. Yeah. Many of our listeners, because we get the emails and the notes all the time, struggle with the agony of losing a child. Would, would you just talk about what that was like for you and John? Yeah. Well, in, in my field, I am a, just skipping ahead a little bit, I'm a thanatologist, which means I'm an expert in death, loss, grief, aging, and transition. So in my field of thanatology, the grief around miscarriage is often what we call a disenfranchised grief. Disenfranchised grief is something that people don't give enough credence to, don't think this is really worthy of grief and sadness and crying. So how many people, when they've had a miscarriage, and myself too, oh, you're young, you can try again. Right. Duh. Well, thanks. I wanted this one. We had dreams, we had plans. You never forget that you were pregnant and then you weren't, and that baby died. So we had got pregnant, spread the news to everybody because we wanted to have a big family. <laughs> Wonder why. We wanted to have a big family. So we got pregnant, spread the news to everybody. And two weeks after we told everybody that baby died. Then about five months later, I was pregnant again. Uh, this time we were a lot more appreciative because we realized that it was not a sure thing that we are not in control, that this was a precious gift to us. And of course, we were overjoyed and designing the nursery and spreading the news and telling everybody we know. And two months after we told everybody that baby died too. After that, it was over a year of infertility where we were trying and trying and just could not. And after that second miscarriage, the doctor said to me, well, you know, one miscarriage, that happens all the time. Two miscarriages, yeah, you can have two miscarriages without a live birth. If you have a third one, then we start wondering why you can't carry a child. So I felt like my body was betraying me. Like, would we ever achieve our dream of having our own biological children? We knew we could adopt and we would. But there's also this dream of having your own biological children. Didn't know if it was going to happen. Finally got pregnant with Carl. And I tell you, when Carl was born, we felt like the luckiest people on the face of the earth. We were so grateful. What a gift. We had a baby boy. And John adored him. I, I did too. But the, it was just, it was wonderful. We, we had the start of our family. We knew that I could carry a child. We knew there might be more miscarriages in the future. We had no clue, but we had a baby boy and mm -hmm. we were thrilled. Do you think you savored and celebrated little Carl even more because of the difficulty of ultimately delivering him and holding him? Really I wouldn't say celebrated way. him more. I would say it's different. There's a difference between actually carrying this baby in my body, feeling him kicking my ribs, feeling him growing in there, talking to him even in utero. Um, that's an experience that John couldn't have. I, I wished he could have, he wanted to, but uh, you know, he, he couldn't have that experience. So there's a difference there because, because of that body connection. Yet at the same time, I would, I would not say that I celebrated Carl more than John did. John was over the top thrilled. You and John are over the top thrilled. You're, you are 25 years old in a healthy relationship with a healthy baby boy and all of the goodness of life in front of you. Yeah. And I, cause this is the inflection point in your story. And I, I just like you to share it in any way you'd like, but, but talk about the last day that you spent with John. Mm. Let me rewind just a little bit to the day before 
John didn't go to work the day before because he was not feeling well and he knew he had to go to this business meeting about three hours out of town the next day. So he stayed home to get some extra rest. I came up from downstairs from putting in some laundry and he was laying on the couch. He had been, he had been sleeping and Carl was sleeping on his chest. And when I came up from downstairs, he was laying on the couch with Carl sleeping on his chest and he had this sort of far off look on his face. And I said, John, what are you thinking about? And he sort of slowly looked over at me and he said, Amy, if I ever die, mm. you make sure you tell Carl how much I love him. The next day he got up at five o'clock in the morning, kissed me goodbye, went out to his business meeting three hours out of town. On his way home that night, another car slammed broadside into his and John was killed instantly. I was absolutely devastated, absolutely devastated. Everything, everything I thought I had, the future I had planned disappeared. Um, Carl, how could, how could I, th I figured Carl wasn't even gonna grow up because he didn't have his dad and I was so inadequate as a mom. There was no way he was gonna grow up. Well, surprise, surprise, he grew up, but I, I was, I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know what to do. I was just totally lost because the, the love of my life, my, my boy's father, my dreams disappeared in an, in a split second, in a split second. You had an uncommonly large network of people who loved you from his family, your community, your town, your friends, your massively large and loving family. And yet you've written and shared this quite a bit that just because there's a lot of them doesn't mean that they knew what to do or what to say or where to go or when to be present and when to give you space. Would you talk about part of the recovery, part of the healing from the perspective of, of how others were there for you and maybe what they could have done differently that might've been more effective in one way or another? Mm. Just to remind our listeners, this is Amy's story, but the story of loss and the story of mourning and the story of grieving a person or a thing that we loved and held dearly will affect every single one of us. And not just relationally, grieving our health, grieving our financial picture, grieving our future, COVID-19, everything causes this sense of loss of connection. And so as you listen to Amy's story again, yeah, it's her story and it's personal. But what is most personal is also most universal. So th yeah. this crosses the line from Amy into all of our lives now. So uh, Amy, for you, talk about what maybe worked from the outset and maybe what could have worked differently and more effectively. I want to just play off of what you just said for one minute. In our conversation before we started, I said grief is triggered by a break in an attachment. Anytime we leave behind something we're familiar with, something we like about our life, something we're attached to, and we have to go forward and learn how, how to live without it, that triggers grief. And any one experience can have more than one grief trigger. There's six main grief triggers. When somebody dies, you lose the relationship, the physical relationship with that person. You lose your role in association with that person. You're not married anymore. I was a single person. I mean, my married friends didn't know what to do with me. All of a sudden, I'm a third wheel or a fifth wheel. I have to figure out how to, uh, how to manage life by myself. I had to figure out how to go out and mow the lawn and have Carl. How, oh, what do I do? I got a baby. How do I go out and mow? The, you know, I had so many things I had to figure out because my role was different. Luckily, I was able to stay in the house. Some people are not able to stay in the house. We bought that house two weeks before he died. Oh. And luckily, I was able to stay there. We had life insurance. Thank you, my dad, because he was an insurance agent. <laughs> like I said, the future, that's called intrapsychic loss, the loss of the future, the loss of the dreams, the assumptive loss. It's not supposed to happen this way. 25-year-old dads are not supposed to die. What is going on here? So many different levels of loss. Yes. And all of those apply in so many other situations that we face in life. 
with COVID, all the relationship loss that happened during COVID, the role changes and becoming an in-home teacher to your kids, the loss of the assumption. Well, every Thanksgiving, we always, well, no, we don't. <laughs> Not this year. You know, no Times Square on New Year's Eve, anybody? No. Plans, visions, dreams, so many things changed with COVID. That was all and is all a grief process, too. You ever lost your phone? <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's not just a physical kind of device. That's right. It's what's in that thing that we're attached to. That's right. It's the, the photos and the messages and the contact lists. And we grieve. That's a littler grief. And it's more easily resolved. But there's little griefs. There's big griefs. There's intersecting griefs. There's complicating griefs. And they all occur in our life all along the way. Mm. And if we learn how to deal with those then we can heal the different layers of grief. We can heal the different types of grief. We can start teaching kids early how to grieve. I think some of the difficulties we're seeing as kids grow up is because they're not taught how to handle their difficult emotions or how to heal, how to process grief. If we knew better how to do that, we'd all be better off. And I learned that, to get back to your question, I learned that big time after John died because nobody knew what to say to me. Right. Nobody knew. What do you say to a 25-year-old widow of a seven-month-old baby boy? What do you say to somebody whose house just burned down? What do you say to somebody who just got stage four diagnosis? What do you say in all these different circumstances? Nobody knew what to say. Nobody knew what to do. They did the best they could. And they did love me. Yeah. Unfortunately, what happens is because we're never taught, everybody picks up what everybody else does and perpetuates the mistakes. And the grieving people end up having to educate people on how to help them. Mm. What do you need? What do you want? What can I do? I don't know. I don't know. I can't even think. I'm just trying to breathe here. Okay. I don't know what I need. So people would say, call me anytime. Well, do you really mean three o'clock in the morning when the tears won't stop and I don't think I can go on? You really want me to call you at three o'clock in the morning? I don't think so. Anything I need? Huh, really? Besides, my life was a shambles. Your life is normal. How big does my need have to be to justify interrupting your normal life to ask you for something I need? I I'm not going to call. It doesn't do any good to say, call me anytime. Every grieving person knows that you've got boundaries and they don't know what yours are. Mm. Every grieving person knows that there's standard things we always say to somebody who's grieving and that's one of them. Some people mean it, some people not so much. Sometimes it's hard to tell who's which. <laughs> you know, all kinds of things that people say that they think are helpful. They tried to cheer me up. You know, look on the bright side. At least you've got Carl. Right. You're still young. Yeah. I'm really glad I've got Carl. Right. But that's totally different than the fact that I don't have John. When we're grieving, every grief, every loss is a both and. Yes, there's things I'm grateful for, things I'm happy about, things I'm relieved over. And at the exact same time, there's things I miss, things I, I long for things I grieve. It's a both and. It's a sad, happy. It's a relieved, hate this. It's everything all at once. You know, people will say to it, if somebody lived a long, oh, he lived such a good long life. You should be so grateful, so happy. Well, yeah, he did live a good long life, but that's why this is so hard. I've never been without him. He was my grandpa. I loved him. Or Oh, at least everybody's still alive. Well, yeah, I'm grateful everybody's still alive, but do you realize I've just lost everything I own in that fire? You know, the, these people trying to cheer me up, people trying to do the right thing without any clue what the right thing might be, people saying things that were unintentionally, I mean, they're well-meaning. People don't intend to be cruel. Very well-meaning things. But so 
help help us then understand not only how to go from the intent of being helpful and sweet and kind to indeed it's back to your book title a friend indeed to That's actually true. being helpful and present and therefore someone who's been through the fire experiencing the yeah. diagnosis going through life now without a grandparent without a spouse without a child with the diagnosis over their head all day long how can we show up fully for people who are struggling yeah you're right. That is why I wrote the book, A Friend Indeed, Help Those You Love When They Grieve, because then if somebody says, what can I do? How can I help? Hey, just read the book, would you? <laughs> this, this will tell you what to write in that condolence card and what to, <laughs> what to say and what to do. That's the reason I wrote the book, because people ask me that question all the time. Well, what do I do? How do I act? What do I say? Many things are are little tweaks or just little differences in what we do. For instance, instead of call me anytime or what do you need to say, listen, I really want to be helpful. Would it help you more if, and then give some concrete options. It has a, a couple of advantages. Number one, like I said, everybody, every grieving person knows other people's got boundaries. I don't know what yours are. If you give me a couple suggestions for things you would be willing to do, okay, now I know kind of what your boundaries are, what lines you're thinking along. So I can choose something you said, or I can choose something with a similar level of commitment. If you said, for instance, would it be more helpful for you if I came and babysat for an afternoon so you could get out by yourself? Or if I came over one evening this week and spent two hours just addressing the envelopes of all those thank you notes that you have to send out, or would it be more helpful if I just take you out for coffee? Or would there be something else? Okay, now I know you'd be willing to spend two hours doing something for me. I know that you'd be willing to babysit for my kids. So even if I don't need it this week, I might next week. You know, I, th I find out kind of what you want. It also gets me out of so much of grief is spent in our emotional centers in our brain, the, the amygdala, the emotion, the, the I just need to survive, you know, the fight, flight, freeze. I just need to survive. I need to figure out how I can put one foot in front of the other. I, I don't even know what's ahead of me. So much is spent in that emotional state. And when you're giving me concrete suggestions that I can see out in front of me, then it gets me more into my frontal, my prefrontal cortex, which is my rational brain, where, okay, I can consider some options up here, yes. even though I could never think of them back here. I can think, I can consider them up here. So offer some concrete suggestions for things you would be willing to do and then say, or would something else be more helpful? Then you're more likely to find out what I really do need. Mm. Well, how you really can help me. I mean this with great respect. When you're speaking to a child, you don't say, are you ready for bed? You say, <laughs> you know, would, would you like to brush your teeth or wash your face before we go to bed? And that way they know like this thing is happening. It's just a matter of what happens in, in what sequence. Mm -hmm. And when we are struggling and who doesn't struggle from time to time, I don't think we know which way is up and I don't think we're ready for yeah. bed. But I do think we recognize we need someone to take us by the hand and walk us to the sink and give us a helpful, loving hand forward. So I, I love that suggestion. I also recognize, though, that the reason why frequently we, in a grocery store, sometimes we will turn away from someone who's just been widowed. We will quite literally turn the cart and walk the opposite way. I'm sure you've had this experience. Why is it, do you think, when all of us have experienced the loss of a parent and a grandparent and will experience the loss of a, a spouse at some point and siblings along the way, that we are petrified and refuse to ever even admit and, and acknowledge the fact that death is part of all of our lives. We live in a death denying society. And it didn't always be that way. I mean, a hundred years ago, we were not so mobile. Families would grow up in the same town, sometimes in the same house, there'd be multi-generational houses, or they would live in the same town. They would grow up together. We didn't have nearly the life expectancy that we have now. So kids grew up, everybody grew up knowing that death was a real reality. Kids died of scarlet fever or whatever. Young adults died. Everybody died. It was a, it was a part of our daily life. 
And if grandma was getting old and getting sick, well, the, the kids were around grandma all the time and they saw her get old and they saw her get sick. And when she died, the family washed and dressed the body and laid it out in the living room and they had a, a visitation or a service in the living room and then they made their own handmade casket and carried it over to the church and had the funeral at the church and she got buried in the churchyard cemetery. Everybody knew who was in that cemetery. Everybody knew death. It was a part of daily life. Over the last hundred years in particular, that all changed. We got the invention of penicillin, increased life expectancy more than any other invention in the history of humankind. We developed things like x-rays. We could actually see into somebody's body and see what was going on in there. And then followed up ultrasounds, MRIs, CAT scans, PET scans. I mean, my gosh, we have all this diagnostic stuff that we can do that we never could do before. We have anesthesia, so we can actually do surgeries without killing people. We have all kinds of research, and we eventually got to the point where we came to believe we didn't have to die. In fact, if somebody we love dies, there's somebody who ought to be sued because somebody didn't do their job. And at the same time, because we developed the, these technologies and we needed instruments and equipment and specialists, and you can't do that at home. So we built hospitals and nursing homes. And because we became more mobile, there wasn't always family there to take care of grandma. When she got older, we needed somebody to take care of grandma. So we, we built facilities and these are wonderful wonderful things we just have to recognize what that did to us in terms of death and of course because people weren't always there at the moment of death we have a whole funeral home industry where they come in most people have no clue what happens to a dead body most people have never seen or touched a dead body oh boy that's scary that is really scary to people nobody has a clue what happens from the time that body dies until it's dressed and laid out and ready for presentation or ready for burial or whatever. Very few people. Now, some traditions, especially some faith traditions, are different about that. But in the United States, it's pretty common that we, we don't know that we outsource. Really, what we've done is we've outsourced death. Mm. We've outsourced aging. We've outsourced medical treatment. And because we've outsourced it, we don't understand it anymore. If we don't understand it and it's not a part of our daily life, it becomes scary. It becomes unknown. And the unknown is always scary. It becomes uncomfortable. It becomes awkward. And the less we talked about it, the more awkward it became. So we grew up. 90% of the people or more in this country grew up thinking of death as a scary thing as a difficult thing that you don't want to have to go through, as something, instead of death being the normal, expected part of life, mm. it became the abnormal, unexpected part of life. Whether somebody died slowly or suddenly, they're not supposed to. When, I, when it's somebody I love, they are not supposed to die. Death is never fair. Death is never right. It's always too soon when it's the one I love. So it becomes this big hairy monster that we don't talk, talk about. about. We don't we don't teach our kids how to deal with it. We don't teach our kids. We think we have to protect kids, keep them away from services, keep them away from people who are sick, keep them away from people who are dying. Don't do that. Don't do that. Well, then they're 18 and they're facing somebody's death and they don't know how to handle it. They don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to grieve. You, and grief that isn't grief that isn't resolved doesn't go away. It stays there and it festers and it will find a way to come back out and bite you. In fact, one of the ways that unexpressed, unresolved grief comes out is in depression. Sometimes I think some of the skyrocketing suicide rates in our country are because people didn't learn how to grieve and how to handle their dif difficult emotions. That was the taboo. It's not acceptable to be sad. We make, when, when we're sad, when we're grieving, we make other people uncomfortable. 
Yeah, everybody wants to be in control. If I am uh, sobbing and you can't fix it, then you feel out of control. You feel helpless and you don't like that. So I don't want to feel helpless. I don't want to feel out of control. I don't want to say the wrong thing. So I'm just going to not say anything at all. That's the way we tend to look at grief. And so, yeah, I would, I would walk down Main Street in Dyersville, Iowa. Now they have one stoplight <laughs> on Main Street. They never even had a stoplight when I was growing up. But I would walk down Main Street in Dyersville and a block away, I'd see somebody cross the street and walk down the other side because they saw me coming because they didn't want to do the wrong thing. So they did nothing. Is there a wrong thing? If someone lovingly crosses the sidewalk towards you and acknowledges the fact that they ache with you, is that ever the wrong thing for them to do? I'm just curious. So for those of us who see someone else on that, on that, on main street or in that grocery store or in the back of the synagogue or church or wherever it might, might be yeah. or online, is it ever the wrong time to just let that person know that they grieve with you? No, what is wrong or what is unhelpful? And it's, it's better to say the wrong thing than say nothing at all, I think, because at least somebody knows you're trying. But the best thing of all is to do helpful things, say helpful things. To say, man, my heart just breaks for you. This has to be so hard. And then ask questions. We're so concerned about not saying the wrong thing. It's not nearly so important what you say is what you ask. Give us some questions that you think would be helpful to ask. What do you wish people knew about what you're going through right now? What do you wish people knew about what it's like now to face the first anniversary of your child's death? Mm -hmm. What do you wish people knew about what it's like to hear ALS come out of your doctor's mouth? What do you wish people knew about what it's like to lose everything you own? What do you wish people knew about what it's like to have a child with disabilities and have everybody looking at you every time you walk down the street with them? What do you wish people knew? They'll tell you what they wish you knew. And it doesn't feel intrusive at all. It's a great question in any situation and any time down the line, because we need to tell the story. Yes. One of the ways that makes it real, when something tragic happens to us, we find ourselves walking around saying, oh, this isn't happening to me. This is a nightmare. I'm going to wake up tomorrow. It's all going to be gone. One of the ways we make it real is to hear the words coming out of our own mouths over and over and over again. But who's willing to listen? Can you listen two weeks after the services? Can you listen eight months after the divorce? Can you listen at a year and a half? Right. Because grief's not over in a year. Sorry, folks, but grief is not over when you get that first anniversary. You've just yes. spent a year of bad anniversaries. <laughs> You've written that the, sometimes the second year is harder than the first. It can be. Because you I, do a whole lot of letting go in the first year. Every time you turn, your, every time you turn around, you're stealing yourself for the first Valentine's Day, the first holidays, the first his birthday, the first my birthday, the first wedding anniversary, the first, the first, the first, the first. Every time you turn around, it's another first. You do a lot of letting go, but you're not done grieving and you haven't built the new yet. That takes longer. So you get to the first anniversary and everybody thinks, oh, all right, hey, it's been a year. All right, you're good now, you're good now all the support disappears. So you get a week into the first, into that second year, you get a week into the second year and something happens and you can't say, oh, a year ago we, oh, no, we didn't. The reality hits home. The reality that they're really not coming back hits home in a way that it didn't the first year. But people expect you're all better. What's the matter with you? wait a minute, it's been 14 months and you still cry? Really? Uh, let's take you to a doctor, get you some medication? No, this is normal. It's normal that grief takes a lot longer than that. And especially on those, what I call marker days, the yeah. days like the birthdays, the holidays, the anniversaries, the things we only get to practice once a year. After John died, I woke up every morning of my life and reached across to an empty pillow. Mm. And after a while, I 
stopped assuming there'd be somebody on that empty pillow. But it's only once a year that Elvis is singing, I'll have a blue Christmas without you, or the mother is lighting the Hanukkah candles, or the, you know, whatever, the, the holiday times come around, or it's the birthday or the anniversary. That only happens once a year, so we, we don't get to practice it very often. And that means those days are painful for a lot longer to come. Hmm. We need to honor that. You and I are recording this on a Tuesday. On Sunday, I was going to lunch with my, my bride and four kids. We're walking down the sidewalk, and I see a friend's mother who I have not seen in decades. And we hug and say hello. And then uh, I say, how are you doing? And she says, well, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm still struggling since she mentioned her husband's name since his passing. And I said, oh gosh, tell me when that happened and what happened. And she said, well, it was 2006. And then she went on from there. So here's a woman who 16 years after the loss of her husband mourns it as if it seemingly it's still fresh. And as I'm thinking about your work and researching you and getting ready for this podcast and being reminded that we all are mourning something and we're going to mourn a lot more before we get out of this thing, yeah. that it doesn't really go away. And if we want, we can just stay focused on that. But here's the cool thing. And this is when I want to do the kind of the, the crossover. This mourning and this grieving and this dying has taught you an awful lot about healing and living and loving and being bold and joyful. So as you have spent now a lifetime looking right at death, unapologetically so, what, what has that taught you about living differently or living a little bit more vibrantly? I live differently because I know that all of life is a gift. Everything I have, everybody I love is a temporary gift. It could all disappear faster than I want to admit or acknowledge. So I live with a level of appreciation that a lot of people don't have. I know when I wake up in the morning that that's a gift. I might not have woken up this morning. Things happen. One, one thing I have done with that, I have made it a practice because, well, let me back up a little bit. The night that John died, he called me on the phone. He said, Amy, I'm on my way home. It, it was a February night in Iowa. He said, it's sleeting and sort of snowing. And it's, you know, it's not the best night, but I know how to drive in this. You know, I'm an Iowa farm boy. I know how to drive in this. I'm just going to take my time and I'll get home when I get home. Don't wait up for me. And the last thing he said to me was, Amy, I love you. And the last thing I said to him was, John, I love you too. Mm. 45 minutes later, he was dead. I, I facilitate support groups. And in the widowed support group that I facilitate, I've heard so many stories of people whose last words were angry, whose last words were, you know, they, they had an argument. He went out and slammed the door. And then out on the driveway, he had a heart attack. Or with a kid, a teenager. How many times you butt heads with teenagers, right? It was so comforting to me. Yeah. To know that John and I, the last words we said to each other was, I love you. So I've made it a habit ever since then, every time I leave somebody I love, whether it be on the phone, in person, the last words I say is, I love you. Because they might be the last words they ever hear from me, or they might be the last words I ever get to say to them. In fact, Carl teases me to this day because he was one of those teenagers, let me tell you, but heads, right? He knew every hot button I had and he knew how to push it. I'm going to call Carl next and make sure that mom is telling the truth on this. Because I would imagine there were some teenage days where mom's final words were not, I love you, Carl. But yes, they were. <laughs> there was one time, I'll give you an example. We were standing in his bedroom and I, I can't remember what he did anymore, but I was so angry over what he did. And we argued a little bit. And then I said, Carl, listen, I am so angry that I want to hit you and I don't want to hit you. So you're going to stay right here and I'm going to go cool off. And then when I'm cooled off, we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about this because we're not going to leave it unresolved. But as I walk out that door, there is one thing I want you to know, even when I am this mad at you, I still love you. And I slammed the door and walked out. 
<laughs> because if I dropped him a heart attack and the stress that boy caused me, then I wanted him to know that, yeah, he, I didn't die because of him. I did. I died loving him. I've always told I, I, you can do all kinds of things that I will be angry at. I will be angry at what you did, but I will always, always, always love you. There's nothing you can do that would make me stop loving you. You have been doing this work and live in this way for now going on decades, but, I, but I've always found with folks like you, the more that you are vulnerable, the more that you are honest about the, the hardship and the brokenness and the beauty and the grandeur, the miracle of life, the more that others are willing and desire to lean into you honestly in ways that probably humble you and maybe ways that you don't feel completely deserving of receiving. Like they probably tell you things they don't tell their own mother. Or oh their yeah. Own the stories I hear when people know it's safe, when they know I accept it, when they know there's understanding there. Oh, the stories that I hear, they come pouring out. So, so then you leave that though, ultimately both inspired and encouraged and filled, but also probably a bit drained. So the, the question, it's going to be one of the final ones is what, what, what fills you back up as you do this work, as you travel around, travel around the country and the yeah. world and saying yes to podcasts and sessions and everything else you do. And you're still a mom and you're still a leader and you're still a lady and you're still all these things. So journeying through life, what, what, what are some things that you do practically that, that fill your bucket? Self-care is really, really important. I am a natural introvert, so I need time by myself to refill. That's what introversion is. Extroverts get their energy from being with people. If they're tired, they want to go out and be with people because that's where they get their energy. Introverts, if I'm tired, I need to be by myself because that's where I get my energy to be able to go out and be with people. So I know for myself, I need to be with myself. I've learned all kinds of self-care strategies. If I absorbed all the pain that I hear, all the grief that I hear in my graduate classes, in my sessions, in my support groups, if I absorbed all of that into myself, it would absolutely eat me from the inside out. I'd be worthless. I have developed with help too. These are, these are things that we all in my field do, develop self-care things that work for me. One of the self-care things that work for me is using my breath. If you, if you breathe in really deep, very big breath all the way down into your belly, and then you blow it out slowly and consciously, taking at least as long for the out breath as the in breath. If you do that three times in a row, it triggers a relaxation response in your brain. Mm. I also consciously, as I'm breathing out, I'm breathing in peace and calm and the divine and spirit. And I'm breathing out grief and pain into the, into the divine, into the universe, into the earth. I breathe it out because it is not mine to hold. Breath is really important. Nature is very healing for me. I have to be out under the blue, blue sky or walking or um, touching nature. It's, I, I live outside Chicago, so there, it's not always green, <laughs> right. but really even crazy. in the winter, I go out and I touch the snow or I, I hug a tree branch or, um, touch the leaves that are evergreen that still stay there and go walking and breathe in the fresh air. Nature is healing for me. Water is healing for me. Writing, writing is something anybody can do anytime. It's one of the ways that I healed after John died. I kept a journal and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote because paper is 100% unconditionally accepting hmm. and nobody ever has to read it and it's available 24 seven. So three o'clock in the morning when I can't sleep and the tears won't stop and I don't think I can go on. For me, I, in my faith, God was there for me at that time and the paper was there and I could write and write and write and write. In fact, sometimes it's a great sleep aid for those of you who are grieving. If you write in your journal for 15, 20 minutes before you go to bed and get all that hamster wheel stuff out, yeah. then you're less likely to lay down and not be able to go to sleep because you've got all this hamster wheel stuff going on. Mm. Or the other thing that happens when people are stressed or grieving is that it's so exhausting. Grief is exhausting. 
that the minute they fall asleep, boom, they're out. But then they wake up at two or three in the morning. Well, write in the journal before you go to bed. And if you wake up in the middle of the night, do it again. And then put it over on the bedside table. Look at it outside of yourself. Get in that prefrontal. Look at it and say, okay, these are all the things on my brain. But I can't do anything about them right now. Yeah. So I'm going to put them over here on the bedside table. They can sleep there. They're not going anywhere. I'm going to see them first thing when I wake up in the morning. But they can sleep there so that I can be free and sleep here. And sometimes that can really help. Amy, we wrap up all of our podcasts with what we call the Live Inspired Seven. But before we ah. get there, I, I do have a final question for you. Sure. A lot of the work that I see you doing is in part around death and dying and healing and grieving. But the opposite of that, if you stop looking at the shadow and start looking at the light, it's just love and vibrancy yeah. and hope and joy. It is. And so uh, as I focus a little bit more on that, give us one thing we can do to liberate us from having regrets as we move through our lives, as we move through our relationships and our jobs and our financial pictures and our mental wellness and everything else we're moving through every single day in order that when we get to the finish line, we will have as few regrets as possible. What, mm. what's, you talked about breath work, you talked about prayer and, and writing, you talked about leaving every conversation with love. Yes, and yes, and yes to all that stuff. Give us one more idea that we can do today so uh, so we can shut our eyes the final time with as little regret as possible. I think we need to be really honest with ourselves. And often this takes the help of a counselor to be able to look at ourselves and see perhaps ways that we grew up or attitudes we gained or, or vulnerabilities we have, that when other people push those buttons, we react in ways that are hurtful. Richard Rohr said, if we don't transform our pain, we transmit it. And I believe that to be true. That's one of the reasons we need to heal from our grief but also there's, you know, all kinds of pain from who we are, how we were raised, what we've been through. We need to be able to work on transforming that pain so that we don't hurt other people out of our own pain. Even healing, we need to heal our own grief so we're not healing people out of our own need. You know, I need to heal you. That's not healthy. We need to be able to operate out of wholeness, not out of hurt. So I think the one of the biggest paths to having as few regrets as possible is to work on oneself honestly and with with help helps it's not a sign of weakness to go to a counselor that's a sign of strength it's a sign of wanting to be better of wanting to heal of wanting to be there for other people of wanting to be as whole as you can be and if we operate out of that hmm. then we will have fewer regrets. We'll never have no regrets. Totally. That, that doesn't happen. We're not perfect people. We're just people doing the best we can with what we got. And we're always going to make mistakes. We're always going to hurt somebody. Go back and forgive. Forgive. If the relationship is worth it, reconcile. Forgiveness doesn't have to result in reconciliation if the relationship isn't such Oh. Somebody who's been sexually abused does not have to reconcile with the abuser, but they do have to forgive them. Forgiveness is unilateral. And we need to work on ourselves until we can reach the point of letting go of the hate, the desire to revenge, the, the things that are negative about it. So we can free our own heart and be free and not transmit that pain to somebody else. Now, what a bow. On, on a beautiful conversation. We wrap up every episode with seven questions. Question number one, what has been the most impactful or inspirational or transformational book you have ever read? After John died, and this is not true for everybody, for me, the Bible was the most impactful and comforting book that I read because I, it showed me how God is there for me no matter what, and that resurrection can come out of anything. Right now, a book I can recommend is, is called Wanting, The Power of Mimetic Desire in Everyday Life. 
it wow. talks about, it's by Luke Burgess, talks about why we want what we want. And if we can understand why we want what we want, then it helps us to transform that, to uh, use desire in positive ways instead of in ways that lead to rivalry and that lead to competition and that lead to wars, that we need to use our the natural desires that we're born with for positive effect. So that's a, that's a book that I'm in the middle of right now and really is a fascinating take. I love it. Tell me what one positive characteristic or one trait that you possess growing up near Dubuque, Iowa, that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? I am relearning again. And I think we all need to relearn this over and over in our lives, that who I am is a person worthy of love, regardless of what I do. I think we are all born believing we're worthy of love. But I learned early on and lived too much of my life thinking that in order to earn somebody's love, I had to be a good girl. I had to do the right things. I had to sacrifice for other people, sometimes to my own detriment. That if as long as I was doing, giving, loving, even over loving, then people would love me. I would earn their love. And that's not right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm relearning again that that I am worthy of love just Period. as who I am. And that frees what I do because I don't have to do what I do in order to earn love. I do what I do because it's the fullest expression of who I am. Mm -hmm. And if somebody loves that, that's great. And if they don't, not everybody's going to love me. I'm okay with that now. That's all right. You don't have to love me. You don't even have to like me. Other people do. And I am worthy of love. Right on. It, it, tell me if your home caught fire and all the <laughs> are out, okay, everything's out. Carl's out, the animals are out, everybody's out. You have an opportunity of getting one item, one possession safely out with you. What's the mm -hmm. one thing you take out with you? Right now, and this is just a snapshot in time, this could change. I would take my mom's jewelry and I would take the baby books. My mom's jewelry because I was very, very close to my mom and wearing her jewelry these are her earrings. Oh, how cool. I wear her jewelry. Well, we call these transitional objects, by the way. Wearing her jewelry keeps her present and close to me because she wore these in her ears. And now I wear them in my ears. And when I, when I wear a pendant of hers, I've got her close to my heart. And I don't, that those are irreplaceable. That's right. Sentimental, irreplaceable. The baby, <laughs> baby books, There, I mean, there's pictures and stories in there that if they got burned, they'd be gone. That's if right. you could sit on a bench on a gorgeous day and have a long conversation with anybody, living or deceased, who do you want right next to you? There'd be so many, but I'm going to pick one. Maya Angelou. <laughs> I love her poetry, but even more so, I love her life story. She's had a life of struggle, of love, of betrayal, of strength, of courage. I think she has tremendous wisdom and she's intensely genuine. Mm. She, uh, she always was who she was and she was comfortable in her own skin and she would sashay her way onto a stage because that's who she was. And I think it would be captivating and lightning to have a conversation with her. Awesome. So that's, that's who I would choose. What's the best advice that my Angelou or anyone else has ever given you? Again, how do you choose that? But you, you know what? We've been, we've been talking about parenting a bit. I'll tell you one piece of parenting advice that I have loved. When Carl was born, I was so nervous about being a good mom. Could I be a good mom? Would I do the right things? Could I raise? I, I was so nervous about being a good mom. And somebody said, just love him yeah. and then do your best to help him become who he was created to be not who you think he should be and wow i have never forgotten that oh and the other they also followed it up and said and along the way don't be too overprotective 
give him as much control as he can handle. And every once in a while, a little more than he can handle so that he can make mistakes while you can pick up the pieces. It sounds like the parenting advice that would be given by a grandparent. I, I think there's just such wisdom in the years of recognizing what matters and what doesn't. And yeah. sometimes you got to swing and miss several times to recognize it, but love yeah. them, period. Just yeah. love them, period. What, what advice would you give yourself at age 20? A few years before a miscarriage and then another one and then an agonizing loss and everything else that followed, what would you say? One thing sort of related to what I've already said. One thing I would say my, to my 20 year old self is that perfection is not the goal. Always trying to be perfect in every, you know, the perfect mom, the perfect wife, the perfect friend, the perfect speaker, the perfect student, the perfect, the perfect, the perfect. That made me afraid to try anything that I didn't already know I was good at. Perfection is safe and insulated and walled and plastic. Yeah. Um, so I think I would tell myself, take risks, be silly, be free, allow for messiness, allow for <laughs> suffering is going to happen, but you can get through. You don't have to be perfect to do it. Make mistakes boldly. As, as Mary Oliver said, choose how you want to live this one wild and precious life. Amy Florian, it has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like yours to read? <laughs> <laughs> you knew it was coming. How do you want yours to read? Recognizing that all of life and everything in it is a temporary gift and that we are not in control. Live as fully as possible every breath you are given. Love fiercely with your whole heart and soul and live your life to the greatest extent possible so that if you had died last night, and you could have, hmm. that you would have died with as few regrets as possible. So strong. Amy, I want to thank you for your work, for your words, for your grief, for transforming it rather than transmitting it and for reminding us that life is indeed precious, that tragedy and difficulty is absolutely part of it. And yet the foundation remains firm. What I heard from you is God remains God and the best is yet to come. What, what a gift you gave us today. So thank you for your work. You're most welcome. It's been a pleasure. My friends, that is Amy Florian. My name is John O'Leary. Today is your day. Don't miss it. No regrets and live inspired. Well, my friends, it is frequently said that everybody is going through a storm. In other words, you're not the only one. We're either just entering into one, we're in the midst of one, or we've just come through one. And that's why this idea of dealing with the grief we all experience in life, all of us, you're not alone, is so incredibly, incredibly important. I want to go back to a quote that I heard Amy share early in our conversation. She said this. You may remember it. You may have written it down. Grief is triggered by a break in attachment. Dang, that's good. Grief is triggered by a break in attachment. Now, so many things can break that attachment. It could be the attachment you felt for a child before miscarrying. And it's a loss that only you and maybe your partner even knew about. Maybe it's ending a toxic relationship with a friend or a partner. Maybe it's the end of what you thought was a healthy, successful marriage or relationship. Maybe it's a change in your career. Maybe it's a difficulty in your finances. Maybe it's celebrating the holidays alone. And that list can go on and on and on. I sincerely hope that today's conversation helps you recognize and embrace the complexity of grief on yourself, but also with others. I think that's a really cool piece, a really important piece to bring forward, not only for you, but for others. And to meet them with compassion, with grace, with guidance along their path to finding peace in their journey. If you are looking forward to uh, learning a little bit more around grief and recovery and taking the next right step forward in your journey, if you enjoy the conversation with Amy, you're going to love the conversation that we had with Maddie Jackson Selkman. It's one of the most listened to episodes out of all almost 500 episodes we've ever recorded. Like Amy, Maddie was a young and unexpected widow, forced to navigate a future radically different than the one she planned. 
This conversation is a reminder that by relying on faith, clinging to hope, we can truly heal. If you want to hear more about that conversation, it's a great one. Alan Jackson is her dad. We talk a little bit about country music, but we talk mostly about life, about grief, about overcoming, and about taking the next right step forward toward truly living inspired. You can check that one out at episode 428. You can learn about that in the show notes or visit me right now online at johnolearyinspires.com forward slash podcast. For those typing a little bit more slowly, here we go one more time. Episode 428 with Maddie Jackson Seligman is available at johnolearyinspires.com forward slash podcast. My friends, I am so humbled and grateful for your continued listenership for your friendship, for you being part of our community. Every single week, every single month, we have more listeners on this Live Inspired podcast. If you enjoy listening as much as we enjoy bringing it to you, a couple ways that you can do your part in getting the message out there. Number one, subscribe. That's a cool way to ensure it shows up in your feed week after week. So subscribe to the Live Inspired podcast. Secondly, post about it on social media. There's so much negativity, so much divisiveness out there. Put forward a message of love, togetherness, yeah, grief and sadness and tragedy, but also overcoming and healing and life. Celebrate the Live Inspired podcast online. And then thirdly, wherever you work or worship or work out, tell your friends, yeah, yeah, they may be listening to something else in the morning or on the way home, but you choose to listen to inspiring, feel-good, inspirational, good news here at the Live Inspired channel. Three cool ways to share the news. So there it is. My friends, I want to thank you for sharing the news. I want to thank you for living the news. And I want to remind you that the foundation is firm. The headwind is real. Yes, it is. But the best is yet to come. So for this time and until next time, my name is John O'Leary. Today is your day. What a gift. Live inspired. At Kelly Companies, it is no secret that they believe in the power of people. In an effort to help their Keelians get to know each other a little bit better, they decided to launch the Who Do You Know campaign. The goal was simple. Keelians were encouraged to have a conversation with someone outside of their circle. That's it. These conversations, however, have brought people together and farthered their world-class culture. Shout out to the Keelians who have made an effort to have meaningful conversations with new friends. You can learn more about those conversations, about those amazing friends, by visiting them online at keelycompanies.com.